Manila, the Philippines, Southeastern Asia, and good late Saturday, Saturday evening, local time. Robert Thompson, with his friend John Venables, was involved in early 1993 in a gruesome, uh, in the gruesome torture and killing of a toddler, James Bulger. And what especially made this gruesome was that the killers were only in their early teens. So they were technically children themselves. So what happened? <clears throat> Robert Thompson was born in August 1982 and committed the murder with John Venables on February the 12th, 1993, aged 10. James Bulger was only two. The methods of murder included beating with stick, bricks, stones, and a piece of metal. The murder took place in Liverpool, Merseyside, England, United Kingdom. And <clears throat> Robert Thompson was released on lifelong license in June 2001. <clears throat> James Bulger, who had been born in March 1990, disappeared on February the 12th, 1993, from the New Strand Shopping Center, Buto, while accompanying his mother. His mutilated body was found on a railway line in nearby Walton on February the 14th. On February the 20th, 1993, Thompson and Venables were charged <clears throat> with the abdu abduction and murder. Thompson and Venables were found guilty of the murder of Bulger in November 1993, making them the modern English and perhaps British history, history's youngest convicted murderers. They were sentenced to custody until they reached adulthood, initially until the age of 18, and were released on lifelong license in June 2001. The case has prompted widespread debate on the issue of how to handle young offenders when they are sentenced or released from custody. In March 2010, Venables was returned to prison for an unspecified violation of the terms of his license of release. In July 2010, he pleaded guilty to charges of downloading and distributing child pornography and was given a sentence of two years imprisonment. A closed circuit uh, TV did catch um, the start of the process that led to the murder of um, Bulger because Thompson and Venables were shown casually observing children apparently selecting a target. The boys were unauthorizedly absent from school or playing truant. Um, in North America, for example, this would be called skipping here in the Philippines, cutting classes. Uh, they actually were regular truants or skippers of lessons. Throughout the day, Thompson and Venables were seen stealing various items, including sweets, a troll, a troll dog, a troll dog some batteries and a can of blue paint, some of which were found at the murder scene. <clears throat> Later, it was found out or revealed by one of the boys that they were planning to find a child to abduct, lead him to the busy road alongside the mall and push him into the path of oncoming traffic. That same afternoon, James Bulger, often called Jamie by the press, from nearby Kirkby, went with his mother Denise to the New Strand Shopping Center. While inside a butcher shop at around 3.40 p.m., Denise realized that James had disappeared. He had been left at the door of the shop while she placed an order and was spotted by Thompson and Venables. They approached him and spoke to him before taking him by the hand and leading him out of the precinct. This moment was captured on a CCTV camera recording time stamped at uh, 15.42 or 3.42 p.m. I remember seeing that footage on either the... Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, which is Canada's public sector uh, broadcasting company, or on the Canadian television CTV, which is a, a Canadian private sector broadcasting company. <clears throat> the boys took Bulger on a four-kilometer walk across Liverpool, leading him to the Leeds and Liverpool Canal, where he was dropped on his head and suffered injuries to his face. <clears throat> the boys joked about pushing Bulger into the canal. During the walk across Liverpool, the boys were seen by 38 people. Bulger had a bump on his forehead and was crying, but most bystanders did nothing to intervene, assuming that he was a younger brother. 
Two people did challenge the older boys, but they claimed that Balja was a younger brother or that he was lost and they were taking him to the local police station. If either one of them had told the boys to leave the younger boy alone and would have threatened to call the police, this might have say, uh, saved James Bulger's life, especially if those uh, adults had been stern enough in their voice because, after all, the two boys were still children themselves, 10 or 11 years old. <clears throat> of course, I mean, uh, asking the children to show their identity papers might have helped, or then asking who their parents were or where their parents lived, or if uh, they could reveal their parents' uh, telephone numbers. All of that could have helped, or where their parents were working. Mm. <clears throat> At one point, the boys took Bulger into a pet shop from which they were ejected or forced to leave. <clears throat> Eventually, the boys led Bulger to a railway line near the disused Walton and Anfield railway station, um, close to Walton Line Police Station and Anfield Cemetery, so close to a police station where they attacked him. At the trial, it was established that at this location, <clears throat> one of the boys threw blue humbral modeling paint into Bulger's left eye. Then the two murderous boys kicked the toddler and hit him with brick stones and a 10-kilogram iron bar, described in court as a railway fish plate. Then they placed batteries in his mouth. Bulger suffered 10 skull fractures as a result of the iron bar striking his head. I mean, 10 kilograms. Uh, since he was not quite three years old at the time, he hardly weighed that much. Alan Williams, the case's pathologist, speculated that Bulger suffered so many injuries that none could be isolated as the fatal blow. Police suspected there was a sexual element to the crime since Bulger's shoes, stockings or socks, trousers and underpants or underwear had been removed. The pathologist's report read out in court stated that Bulger's foreskin had been manipulated. When questioned about this aspect of the attack by detectives and the child psychiatrist Eileen Vizard, Thompson and Venables were reluctant to give details. Before they left him, the boys laid Bulger across the railway tracks and weighted his head down with rubble in the hope that a train would hit him and make his death appear to be an accident. After the killers left the scene, his body was cut in half by a train. Bulger's severed body was discovered two days later on February the 14th, 1993. A forensic pathologist testified that he had died before being struck by the train. As the circumstances surrounded the death, became clear tabloid newspapers denounced the people who had seen Bulger but had not intervened to aid Bulger as he was being taken through the city as the Liverpool 38. Many people predictably became angry in Liverpool. One boy's family, uh, who was, the boy had been detained for questioning but subsequently released, had to flee the city. The fact that the boys were so young came as a shock to investigating officers headed by Detective Superintendent Albert Kirby of Mersey, Merseyside Police. Early press reports and police statements had referred to Bulger being seen with two youths, suggesting that the killers were teenagers, the ages of the boys being difficult to ascertain from the images captured by CCTV. Forensic tests also confirmed that both boys had the same blue paint on their clothing as found in Bulger's body. So this, that was the so-called smoking gun in addition to the uh, CCTV footage. Both had blood on their shoes, another smoking gun. Blood on Thompson's shoe was matched to Bulger through DNA tests. The boys were charged with Bulger's murder on February the 20th, 1993, and appeared at South Sefton Youth Court on February the 22nd, 1993, when they were remanded in custody to await trial. 500 protesters gathered at South Sefton Magistrates Court during the boys' initial court appearances. Uh, the parents of the accused were moved to different parts of Britain and assumed new identities following death threats from vigilantes. The full trial opened at Preston uh, Crown Court on November the uh, 1st, 1993, conducted as an adult trial with the accused in the dock away from their parents and the judge and court officials in legal regalia. 
At the trial, the lead prosecution counsel, Richard Hen Enriquez, Queen's counsel, successfully rebutted the principle of Dolly in Capax, which presumes that young children cannot be held legally responsible for their actions. The child psychiatrist, Dr. Eileen Vizard, who interviewed Thompson before the trial, was asked in court whether he would know the difference between right and wrong, <clears throat> that it was wrong to take a young child, a child several years younger than himself, or many years younger, actually, from uh, the child's mother, and that it was wrong to cause injury to a child. This replied, if the issue is on the balance of probabilities, I think I can answer with certainty. Dr. Susan Bailey, the Home Office or Interior, British Interior Ministry, forensic psychiatrist who interviewed Venables, said unequivocally that he knew the difference between right and wrong. <clears throat> the two boys, by then aged 11, were found guilty of Bulger's murder at Preston Crown Court on November the 24th, 1993, becoming the 20th century's youngest convicted killers. The judge, Mr. Justice Morland, told Thompson and Venables that they had committed a crime of unparalleled evil and barbarity. In my judgment, your conduct was both cunning and very wicked. Shortly after the trial, Lord Taylor of Gosforth, the Lord Chief Justice, ordered that the two boys should serve a minimum of 10 years, which would have made them eligible for release in February 2003 at the age of 20. The case led to public anguish and concern at moral decay in Britain. In 1999, lawyers for Thompson and Venables appealed to the European Court of Human Rights that the boys' trial had not been impulsed since they were too young to follow proceedings and understand an adult court. The European Court fortunately dismissed their claim that the trial was inhuman and degrading treatment, but upheld their claim they were denied a fair hearing by the nature of the court proceedings. <clears throat> In June 2001, after a six-month review, the parole board ruled the boys were no longer a threat to public safety and could be released as their minimum tariff had expired in the February of that year. The Home Secretary or Interior Minister, David Blunkett, approved the decision, and they were released a few weeks later on a life license after serving eight years. They were given new identities and moved to secret locations under a witness protection style action. The terms of their release include the following. They are not allowed to contact each other or Bulger's family. They are prohibited from visiting the Merseyside uh, region where the murder took place. Curfews may be imposed on them and they must report to probation officers. Breach of those rules would make them liable to be returned to prison. If they were deemed to be a risk to the public, they would be returned to prison. The Manchester Evening News named the secure institutions in which the pair were housed in possible breach of the injunction against publicity, which had been renew renewed early in 2001. In December 2001, <clears throat> the paper was fined £30,000 for contempt of court and ordered to pay costs of £120,000. Mm -hmm. Bulger's parents, Ralph and Denise, divorced in 1995, and Denise married Stuart Fergus in 1998. In April 2010, a 19-year-old man from the Isle of Man uh, was given a three-month suspended prison sentence for claiming in a Facebook message that one of his former work colleagues was Robert Thompson. In August 2009, Australia 7 Network used real footage of the abduction to promote its police show City Homicide. The footage is used was criticized by Bulger's mother and 7 apologized. A tie-in with this saw the Sunrise co-hosts asking the rhetorical question of whether the killers were now living in Australia. When the question was answered later that August, they used one minute and seven seconds to relate the Australian government's two-line denial that they had been settled in Australia. A Holly Oaks storyline set to begin in December 
2009 was axed after the show gave Bulger's mother, Denise Fergus, a special screening. The storyline was to feature Loretta Jones and her friend Chrissy, who had been given new identities before arriving in the village after being convicted of murdering a child at the age of 12.